Okay. Hello, all. My name is Chris Carragher. I am the founder of Seacoast Paddleboard Club. I really appreciate everyone taking the time out of their day to join us for tonight's paddle chat. I hope everyone is healthy and doing well. Uh, the goal of these chats is to bring the paddleboard <clears throat> community together here uh, in New Hampshire and across the country uh, so we can learn from one another and stay optimistic. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Seacoast Paddleboard Club and who we are, uh, we are, in fact, a social club that was formed back in 2015 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We have just shy of 100 members who actively paddle in New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, and Massachusetts. And our club motto is to get people out on the water, have fun, and give back. So in addition to hosting regular meetup paddles, uh, Seacoast Paddleboard Club also hosts regular charity paddles, beach cleanups, and other activities to support our local communities. If you'd like to learn more about Seacoast Paddleboard Club, I'd encourage you to check us out at SeacoastPaddleboardClub.com or on Facebook or Instagram. Before we get started for tonight, I just want to take a pause and say thank you uh, to our first responders and those out serving um, as essential employees during this pandemic. Uh, many of our uh, club members are on the front lines and they are in our thoughts. Uh, before we kick off tonight's uh, webinar presentation, a couple of housekeeping. Uh, everyone, the participants, the room is pretty full tonight. Uh, so we have everyone on mute. If you'd like to ask a question, we'd ask you to use the QA feature uh, in the bottom right there. And if you could refrain from asking questions to the end of the presentation, that would be appreciated. And this is obviously being recorded, so you will be able to watch this on demand after. With that aside, uh, tonight's webinar, An Introduction to Paddleboard Fishing, is being presented by my good friend Sean Quinn from The Wandering Paddler. Uh, Sean is the owner and paddler in chief of The Wandering Paddler, a mobile company that offers sub tours, lessons, and rentals here uh, in the greater New Hampshire seacoast area. The minute Sean stepped onto a paddleboard, he felt what he calls the glide, where everything becomes peaceful inside and he can experience the world in a unique way. I'm sure many of us can relate to that. He loves seeing the world from a paddleboard and is thrilled to be able to share this with others. Sean is an ACA level one sub instructor. And since discovering paddleboarding in 2015, he's locked thousands of hours on the water, often with a fishing pole in his hand. Um, I've had the pleasure of fishing with Sean quite a bit over the years, uh, so it's my honor to actually present and turn it over to Sean. Sean, welcome tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Chris. Uh, thanks. I appreciate that. I'd also like to second your uh, <clears throat> thanking the first responders. Uh, I used to be one, and it's tough work out there, and all of that support I know helps them along the way, and I'd like to add mine to that as well. So I hope everybody's having a, a, you know, a good evening, a mellow evening. <clears throat> As Chris said, my name's Sean. Uh, I love everything paddleboarding and realized one day fish would be, you know, striper would be flying by underneath my board while I was out there. I put two and two together and finally came up with four and said I should have a pole. <clears throat> I used to fish quite a bit when I was younger with my dad um but then i kind of got away from it as i got older and discovered girls and other stuff like that and uh you know i kind of got away from it and coming back to it uh you know paddleboarding has been a blessing for me in, in more ways than one coming back to it uh you know i discovered fishing again and it's been great so i want to preface this by saying i'm not by any stretch of the imagination uh, any kind of expert angler or, or anything like that i'm i'm learning along the way too i'm just going to talk about some of the things that i've discovered um getting into fishing that have uh, helped me along the way uh you know making things more convenient making because it's a little bit different on a paddleboard you have less room you don't want to clutter up that room on the board you also want to be safe with the with the gear that you have on there so that's all we're going to talk about today um you can fish 
freshwater, which is most mostly my experience, um, has been freshwater. Although uh, Chris has gotten me into striper fishing, and I do saltwater fishing now as well. Um, I have yet to hook into a keeper myself, but I've caught a couple of schoolies, and uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. So I'm going to speak a little bit from the freshwater perspective. Um, some of the first things we need to talk about too are safety. Uh, you know, you got to be safe. You got to, I'm wearing a waist, uh, a belt pouch PFD here, but um, you know, everybody, I, I, we posted a link regarding the U.S. Coast Guard regulations for paddle boarders this year. <clears throat> now, those are the Coast Guard regulations. Uh, the state regulations uh, may differ, you, but we also posted a link for the U.S. Fish and Game, which will have some of those. I don't believe they do. Um, the only thing they might differ on is regarding a standing light on your board. The Coast Guard states you just have to have a flashlight. But you can read those regulations for yourself because it's important to know those and those help you be safe. Um, you know, so a PFD, a whistle and a light essentially is what it comes down to. Um, now, other safety gear that people, uh, that you can use fishing, but there are times where you shouldn't use them are, are things like leashes. Um, you know, if you're, depending on the situation that you're in, if you're in rougher water, you don't necessarily want to be leashed to your board. Because the other thing about fishing on a paddle board too, is especially in freshwater, you could paddle up to places that are perfect to cast from and just have your board attached to your belt, you know, with a, a you take a piece of rope and attach it to your board and stand there and fish in the shallows. <clears throat> but you can also fish from the board. Those are, those are up to conditions, but being safe for those conditions. Another thing about, um, being safe around here, especially this time of year, is wetsuit uh, or dry suit. Uh, you know, it'll, it's starting to starting to get warmer again, and come the end of May and beginning of June, it's going to be 75 degrees out there, and people are going to want to go out paddleboarding and <clears throat> and think that just wearing a t-shirt and shorts <clears throat> is going to be okay. The problem is the air might be 75 degrees, and you may be sweating, <clears throat> but right now uh, the water temperature is going to hover around 52, 53 degrees, and uh, that's uh, dangerous, dangerous water to be in for any length of time. Um, so make sure you're prepared for the environment. Okay, the only other sort of uh, stick in the mud thing I have to talk about is knowing your, your regulations. Uh, the fish and game site that we provided the link to will uh, allow you to buy your license. You can buy it by the day, you can buy it by, the, you know, it's very, very flexible. But you need to be, you need to be a licensed fisherman out there. <clears throat> um, and, you know, they also have <clears throat> regulations regarding seasons, how many fish you can take type and what baits can be used and can't be used. So that's, that's a huge resource if you want to get into fishing. So know those regulations and be safe. Um, so like I said, fresh water, salt water, there's a small schoolie there, and there's a fairly decent bass. Um, there are, we live in an area where there are just a bazillion places to go fishing and a paddleboard sometimes makes it easier to get into and out of those places without having to bring a boat and a trailer and all that stuff. Um, anybody can do it. You can, you can go, uh, for instance, in this picture here, I'm, I'm on a board that's bespoke designed for fishing. It's got all sorts of paddle boards, you know, uh, it's got paddle holders, it's got my fish finder on it, it's got rod holders, I've got the cooler. And uh, Aaron here is, just uh, she's got a fishing rod and she's standing on a basic you know a basic board and it's that easy you can get as diff you can get as technical as you want but really anybody with a fishing pole a pfd um, a hook a worm <laughs> and a paddle and a board can get out there and do this um, these are some examples of some of the different setups that i was talking about uh, this is sort of a middle of the road the, the one on the left with the bucket that's just a, a five gallon um, bucket uh, rotomole bucket. You can use it for bait, you can use it for refreshments, um, and then you see a, a, a socket for a rod holder. Some of these holders are dependent upon uh, sea mounts, these circular mounts that you see on the boards, and not all boards have them. Um, most boards have a couple of them. Um, for instance, this Palhana board, which was made for fishing, but it's, it's a surf style board. It has a lot of those mounts as well. Not necessary, helpful. There's other options around those things. You can use things like a piece of rope to secure your paddle you know, to the board. It's, it, it could be that simple. So this you can see, I've got it kind of loaded up with some tackle, uh, some of my safety gear. Uh, another thing we can start to talk about too is the use of an anchor while fishing. <clears throat> um, there's a couple ways to do it. Anchoring up in the right spot um, can be useful, you know, so you're not blown around too much. But you can also you also need to pay attention to things like, especially in the ocean and stuff. Sometimes being anchored when the current switches and starts really running around here, as it does, uh, it, it you know 
it'll sink you. It's not good. So you just want to pay attention to the, your recommendations. But I use a, a three and a half pound little boat anchor here, small boat anchor. And then uh, on my, um, here's my, yeah, again, that's that simple setup. And on this board, you'll see uh, in a couple of pictures, I have a sand spear that actually there are through holes in the board that allow me to take this out eight foot, nine foot sand spear and sink it down into the soft. If you've know, you got a soft bottom, you can sink it down. I, mean, I have no idea why I'm looking at my computer while I'm talking. <clears throat> but so there's uh, multiple ways to anchor up. Uh, but as I said, you just want to pay attention to where you're anchoring. This is a this is my my fishing board, but it's set up for camping. I've got my I've got you know that's fully loaded. That that board again though is designed to carry me in 300 pounds of gear. So you can fish on smaller boards, but you want to pay attention to the loads that you're putting on them. Um, fish finder, you know, uh, on some of the bigger lakes and stuff, I I've, I've used a fish finder on my board. So as I said, I guess these are just examples of how technical you can get with the setups. <clears throat> and it really does depend on a the kind of fishing that you're doing. Uh, you know, freshwater and even what kind of freshwater, whether you're bass fishing or trout fishing, um, you know, uh, there'll be slightly different setups, but you can, there are bespoke boards from boat, be, uh, they, they make a, a, a good fishing board, this Ahab, they also make a couple of smaller ones that are, that are good for fishing. Uh, there's a couple of other companies out there, uh, Live to Fish is one, L2F, that make <clears throat> boards specifically designed for fishing and have accessories built into the boards to help secure gear and poles and stuff like that. So you could do any kind of fishing, spin casting, fly casting. Um, it's, people will think fly casting can be challenging on a board, but if you're, if you're a competent paddleboarder, you don't have to be an expert or anything. It's, you'll get used to it, it's pretty easy. Now the coolers, uh, you can use anything from a five gallon bucket um, to you know, a fairly good sized cooler. You might want to, if you're a beginner, you might want to secure it, make sure it's secured. Usually there's going to be at least two C-mounts on that side and you can put D-rings there and secure that cooler down. So if you do go over, <clears throat> that equipment will stay at least with your board. Because um, that's the other thing too, that, you know, all of this gear is so that we can secure our, uh, our equipment to, to the deck. Because if you go over in the ocean and the, with the current running, you know, your gear's 300 yards down river before you know it if you dump. So if it's attached to your board while being safe, you know, you don't want it attached to you or, or something that you can get tangled up in, but um, being attached to your board is key, uh, which brings me to uh, an experience that I'm familiar with, which is losing fishing poles while on a paddleboard in the ocean, in, per in this case in particular, you know, you spend a couple hundred bucks on a really nice um, striper rod and you set it down next to you and go and reach for bait and it falls over and there it goes. It's 60 feet of water or 70 feet of water and you can't, you're not going to get it. So there are things that they make called leashes for, for rods that you can attach them to the bottom. You can either leave them attached while you're casting or just have them on board so that when you're not casting and they're not in your hand, if they fall off, you don't lose your equipment. Um, so sea, uh, you know, fishing in the ocean is a little bit different. Again, you're just having, you're making sure you're planning for your conditions. Um, this is a cooler that I built that uh, I just bought the rotomotive cooler and I screw um, rocket launcher rod holders on the back of it. Uh, and then I have some other specific mounts for fishing on that. Um, so really you don't, and some people are even crazy enough to fish on uh, a racing board, uh, you know, <laughs> in the ocean too, but uh, more experienced paddlers, that's a less stable board for casting, but more experienced paddles when we get away with it. Um, Chris is the one who got me into striper fishing. And so he's going to be able to talk a little bit more perhaps about uh, the, the, the differences um, that you want to think about when you're out there looking for striper. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, thanks, Sean. I think one of the, you know, you talked about the conditions and where we do live on New Hampshire seacoast. You know, where I'm going striper fishing, the most important thing, and it's just, I don't care if you're, subsurfing or you're you're going for a tour whatever you're doing on a paddleboard you always look at the conditions and one of the things i've learned probably the hard way you know i've been caught off guard before um is definitely look at the weather and i refuse to fish with the, any wind above like eight miles an hour eight knots um that's a no-go it's too you're going to get spun around there i like to drift fish off of newcastle 
um, gotten pretty good at it. You know, you're jigging for, you know, the two poles you're seeing in this photo, the back pole is actually my jigging pole. So I will jig for actually live mackerel. And then the larger pole up front, I actually will live line off of that. So the live line off a of paddleboard for what will essentially be a 30 to 40 inch striped bass, you got to be prepared. Um, I do use a yoga anchor. But again, this is where the things you're talking about, about safety, you know, you see the leash, obviously, I don't want to be separated from my board at all. Um, but more importantly, it's the conditions. You know, if there's any sort of chop, if there's any sort of wind, the current in Piscataquel can wipe you right out into the ocean in a matter of minutes. So you really have to be, you know, have some sensibilities about yourself and just always look at the conditions before you go fish. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and, and we keep harping on it, but if the conditions, right? I mean, uh, I, I'm speaking just from a fishing point of view. And, and so I, I'm sort of assuming that people that are watching uh, have, have a bit of experience. And we all know um, all it takes is, you know, you'll be out there in seven, eight miles an hour uh, of wind and um, the, it'll change your whole trip if it comes up to 12, 14 miles an hour, you know, suddenly it becomes work, right? It's, it's no longer, I mean, it's fun still sometimes, but you want to be prepared for that. And when you have a whole bunch of stuff on your board, a fishing gear and all of that, um, you kind of don't want to have to worry about that when those things come up. And as we all know, uh, with, with, you know, the wilderness and the ocean in particular, uh, anything can happen. It can, it can, you know, conditions can come up at any time. So we just need to be careful about that. Um, so I guess the bottom line here, folks, is, is that anybody, uh, you know, this is safety gear for only a particular uh, time of the season, by the way, uh, but anybody can do this. Anybody can, um, can, can bring a board and some tackle. You can find, you know, if you even just have a little belt pouch or, or a, a Tupperware uh, container to put some tackle in and bring your fishing pole and, and you're good to go. You know, again, know your conditions check your weather, know the, the regulations and the fishing laws for, the, or for where you are, uh, for the state regarding New Hampshire or Maine or Vermont. Um, and, um, you know, you'll, you'll get to learn the rest along the way. Stuff that you should take uh, with you, even as a basic, uh, you want to bring, if you, if, you, if you have a leash, your leash is great not only to keep you attached to the board when you're fishing, but say you're fishing in the shallows and you're standing in the shallows and casting, it keeps your board from going too far away right um, and it you know you can you can use it to tie down uh, so leash or a piece of rope if you don't have a leash for your board or, or don't like a leash just so you can tie it to your PFD um, you know 10 foot of rope and allow your paddleboard to stay with you and not drift away um, uh, a five gallon bucket it's a simple easy effective thing that you can a kind of it, they're not necessarily all waterproof but you can sort of keep your gear dry while it's on the deck and even if it goes over if it's if the lids close well enough and you get to it in time which you should um you can get it back on the deck without losing gear um uh anchors sometimes a little yoga anchor um just to have if you want um you know to bring up another point when, that that chris was uh, if you hook into a big keep of striper i'm not sure how much i'd want to be anchored um, you know, I'd rather have them tow my fat butt around and get tired uh, than be anchored and work on a, on a paddleboard. But that's just, maybe that's just preference. My point is, is you'll learn as you go. You'll find your preferences. You'll find things that work. And the do-it-yourself way, you know, that there's plenty of little, I'm sure tons of people can come up with interesting little solutions for the little things that you want. You want to make sure your paddle stays with you. You know, I, I use paddle clips. So when I'm casting, I don't have to worry about my paddle falling off. Some people just, again, uh, have a little loop that's on the on the side of their belt, and when they're casting, they put they hook the paddle, the handle, just into that loop, you know, and lie the paddle behind them. So it'd be so you you want to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, I hope this has been somewhat informative uh, for everybody. Um, you know, that's, that like I said, a beginner, and that's what I got. Uh, and any questions, please. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love yeah. to answer some questions. So yeah, Sean, we definitely have some questions coming in here. So, um, what's your favorite spot to go fishing in the seacoast? Any place you would not recommend? Um. Well, it's it depends on I guess what you so. Freshwater, one of my favorite spots to go fishing around here is actually Patuckaway, Lake Patuckaway, which isn't technically the seacoast, I guess, uh, but it's, it's the state park in Raymond, and that's only 25 minutes away. Um, as far as saltwater fishing, uh, 
off of Newcastle is one of the places that I like to go. I've caught schoolies yeah. just just beyond the bridge at Pierce Island before. Um, uh, and actually, also, I should mention the Pecassic Street Boat Launch in Newmarket on the Upper Lamprey is a great place to go. It's really mellow. You can get bass. It's beautiful. Uh, there's beaver everywhere. Yeah, uh, and one little tip here, I think, if I can jump in, is the Exeter, the Squamscott River right now, right by the fish ladder in, in downtown Exeter, usually around May 15th is when the uh, – the fish start rolling in the outlife. And when the outlife roll in, you can actually go cast net there and actually it's a great spot to paddle fish. I think, you know, hopefully we'll get out there sooner rather than later. Um, but that's where the school has come actually the striper, the bigger stripers come to spawn. So this time of year from like May 15th to early June, before they go out into the actual oceans, that's a really good spot up there in new market as well. Yeah, indeed. Anything there. So those are both at the bottom of sort of Great Bay that, you know, where, where Great Bay comes in and those rivers, you know, one runs exit or the other in the new market. And a lot of those tri little tributaries, right, you'll see schoolies w w when they're spawning. Isn't that, am I right, Chris? Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah, it's the whole spawning season right about now. And it's a great time to go fishing. Right on. Well, thank you for that question. Yeah, there's another one here. Uh, do they stock this uh, in the lakes and rivers around here? So do they stock fish in the lakes and rivers? So. Um, yes, they do. Uh, I know that they stock, for instance, um, the Pecassic River, uh, both above Wadley Falls, um, and there's another point on that river. But uh, So there's a, a company called Seven Rivers uh, that um, deals with, they spawn for the Fish and Wildlife Management Service. Uh, as far as other, I know that they do, I know that they do, um, uh, you know, drop, drop trout in, uh, for instance, I don't know exactly which rivers other than I know that they do on the Pacific for sure. But yes, they do stock. Awesome. And the question from Nancy, I love this question. Can we arrange a hands-on, let's try fishing event? Nancy, for you, anything. <laughs> but yes, of, of, I would love to do something like that. If people, if people are interested, I would, I'd be happy to do that. And just, we, we got to be bear in mind where we are in the time and place and where we have to plan to social distance. And, but hopefully we will get past this and we will all get to go fishing together soon. I agree. Um, but one of my things about paddleboarding is it's an automatic social distancer. I mean, you're on your own island. You know, it, it doesn't get, it's, it's a fairly easy way to socially distance and have fun. Absolutely. Uh, here's a good question for you, Sean. Um, what's the biggest lesson you learned when you were first getting started? Fishing? Um, yeah, secure your fishing pole to your... Um, <laughs> to your board. Uh, Chris was with me. I just bought, I was really proud of this new Pen 5. Uh, and, and, you know, literally I'd had it three days. And all I did was lean over once and not think. And it was on the edge of the board and it went in and I just watched it go down. I'm like, well, there goes a couple hundred bucks. My wife's going to be happy with me now. Um, you know, so uh, little things like that, that you'll learn, ah, Oh, there's a way around that. Maybe rod holders are worth it. And there are different ways to do rod holders. So just attaching your gear uh, to the board, I guess, would be my biggest lesson. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Lily. We just got a nice shout out. This is great. Thank you. So we appreciate you joining us, Lily. Really excited to thank have you, you with us tonight. Um, when do you usually, here's a question for you, Sean, when do you usually wear a dry suit versus a wet suit or extra protection as needed? When do you usually wear a dry suit versus a wet suit? So I personally, I prefer for paddling, I prefer a dry suit. It's only when they get too, like it gets to be too hot in the summertime where really it's cuspal whether you need them. My general rule of thumb, as far as whether I need protection from the water, wet suit or dry suit, to, um, dry suit you can dry suit you can go a little more extreme because you can wear flannel underneath it right uh, you can you stay dry a wetsuit uh, there's a little bit less of a range but my, my basic rule of thumb is the 120 degree rule where if the temperature of the air plus the temperature of the water is less than 120 
total, um, then you should have you should be in some form of protection regarding the water. That's a that's a rule of thumb, um, you know. And that so that also says that if you know if the air is seventy and the water is fifty two, you know that's cuspal. That's still I mean you can't spend very much time in that kind of water. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that's a great answer. Ah, okay. So I know you talked about losing your rod, because I remember that day very, <laughs> very <laughs> like it was yesterday. Yeah. Um, a question about rod floats. I mean, this is a good question, because, I mean, we've used pool noodles, right? You know, you can use those pool noodles, and they work pretty well. So. Yeah, that's, that's a good something. option. Now, I will say this, though. Um, like you I think you saw on one of my rods, uh, the second deep sea fishing rod that I bought uh, since I lost the first one, I did have a float on it. Um, now, the thing is, is it really depends on uh, the size of the float. You don't want it to interfere with your line at all, right? You know, you, you don't want it to be a pain in the butt. But like that rod that I have, it will still sink if I just let it there, but it'll, it'll sink slow enough where maybe I can grab it. So you just got to pay attention to the size of the reel, the, how heavy the reel is and how big you want to get with that float. Yeah, I, I really like the leashes, quite honestly. the I've been using those a lot last summer is when I started using them a lot and they're just great. It's a godsend. Um, Lily giving you some accolades here, Sean. Nice to see you, Sean, always wearing a PFD and to see him wear it with the bag in the front. This is a, this is a great, great point here, wearing the bag in the front. You see a lot of paddlers that wear the bag in the back and it's hard to reach, right? You can't get to that ripcord. So it's, that's the way it's designed to be worn and great to support safe boating message to everyone. So good job, Sean. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Lily. I appreciate that. Ah, we have a question coming up. This is definitely for, well, it could be sandworms. Worms versus baits. So this, what are you using for bait mostly? Let's go freshwater and then we can go saltwater. So if you want to take the freshwater one, go ahead. Sure, yeah. For freshwater, I mean, I fish with everything from plastics, plastic worms to lures um, to live bait as well. It really depends on the species, the time of year. And this is, now let me preface this by saying, this is what I've discovered so far. Um, I'm not an expert, but really it depends on the species at time of year. Now, honestly, I didn't think when I first heard this, a fisherman told me this, I was like, that's crazy. If so, I'll be fishing a plastic that they should be biting on like a plastic crawfish or something they should be biting on, but they're not. He said, change the color. So you change it to a different color, you have several different colors of the same type of, and you'll find that there'll be a couple of colors, for instance, that they're hitting on more than anything else. I don't get it, but, but it's true. So really it depends on a number of conditions, water temperature, how deep they are, um, what, what the topography of the, uh, of the um, bottom is like. Uh, and again, you know, whether you're fishing, trout is, is different certainly than, than fishing for bass. Um, striper fishing, my only experience with striper fishing, and Chris, you'll, you'll, you'll speak more to this, but um, using mackerel um, and uh, using um, uh, plastic lures that are like eels, sand eels. I, I've actually used eel too, but Chris, that's it. Yeah, that's, no, absolutely. And I'm, I'm more live line, like I said earlier. I, I typically, you can use anything from Pollock mackerel uh, bunker, which come up from uh, the Chesapeake Bay, and actually this past summer there were just bait balls everywhere at the bunkers, and we were actually snagging them two, three miles off the coast uh, on like practice, like training paddles. I'd bring a fishing and just throw a little jig out there and side hook them, you know, go fishing from there. Nice way to break up a training exercise. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> so just. Um, just seeing if there's any other questions, definitely feel free to jump in. Uh, this has been awesome, Sean. I really appreciate you taking the time out, sharing your knowledge. Oh, um, thanks. I'm, I know you spend a lot here. of time on the water, so. <laughs> yes, it, it is true. It's, uh, yeah, I do, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest, I really do find it to be that space. I, it, you know, I've had ADD all my life and it's the best ADD drug <laughs> there is known to man. I can just focus and quiet my mind out there. Yep. Why not fish? That's, no, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. And I mean, the whole goal of these paddle chats is really to, you know, if we can change one person and turn them on to a different 
dynamic of the sport, whether it be sub surfing or sub fishing or just, you know, getting on a paddleboard for the first time, just for the pure enjoyment. You know, I, I consider these types of talks like a huge success. So I really appreciate you taking time again. My pleasure. It's honestly a core philosophy of my company. You know, I, I just want to put people on boards. I'm never going to become a millionaire doing this, not in monetary means anyway, uh, but I just love it when people are trepidatious and not sure, and then they leave and they're, they've, they've successfully paddled and they've experienced paddling and enjoy it. And that's, that's what I live for. That's awesome. All right. Well, looking at the time, I think we're good. Um, so I'm going to stop your presentation here and pull up your website. If anyone would like to learn uh, more about The Wandering Paddler and Sean, I mean, I would encourage you to check him out at thewanderingpaddler.com. And for any of the uh, websites that Sean mentioned earlier in terms of nav navigational rules and regulations, we have them up on the screen now. You can take a look at those New Hampshire Fishing Game website. Uh, the U.S. Coast Guard for obviously a really good resource for just safety and best practices. Really, as a club, I know one thing I will say for Seacoast Paddleboard Club and the Wandering Paddler, I mean, we want people to be safe. We want the pure enjoyment of the sport. And that's, first and foremost, we are advocates for safety. And that's really what we would leave you with. So I appreciate Sean and everyone, all of the attendees taking time out. Um, thanks. And... We will see you next Wednesday night. I believe the topic is going to be uh, Seacoast Paddleboard Club, what club membership means to me. So pretty, pretty good one. I know we have a pretty robust community, so I look forward to seeing everyone next week. And again, Sean, thanks so much. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.